After very first time when human stem cells were derived, human embryonic stem cells were derived, um, the research started taking place towards um, towards uh, disease modeling. So uh, we, we started to learn how to differentiate these cells to different lineages. And a big um, interest was to neural lineages, and especially because some untreatable diseases like Parkinson, Alzheimer, ALS, and just to name few. And those um, diseases called aging diseases, um, but it's also um, onset of these diseases in genetic uh, form is quite early, in um, early 40s. So um, with increasing age, um, average age of population, um, these diseases become epidemic for not just developing country, but pretty much for all countries. And it does um, affect, um, really um, cost effective, um, because um, the a care for these diseases is very expensive. So um, the government and um, the entire world puts a lots of uh, funding and there are lots of private funding to um, actually fund this type of research for, for um, diseases that are untreatable and particularly age-related diseases. So first, uh, in the, the embryonic stem cells actually gave a hope for these diseases. And in my opinion, it's not necessarily these diseases can be cured by differentiating, for example, stem cells into neurons and actually transplanting them in the brain because these diseases are very complex. Particularly if they start, for example, Parkinson, it's a star, the neurodegeneration started by deaths of, of the neurons, particularly the dopaminergic neurons, and in small portion, the side of the brain that called substantial Niagara. And those, uh, just maybe a couple of thousand cells, dopaminergic neurons, actually um, the ones that synthesize um, dopamine, and dopamine is a transmitter. In the end, um, it's actually connect the neurons in order the, the for the motor function. And when the, those dopaminergic neurons for some reason die off in substantial Niagara, so the whole body suffers by, by lacking dopamine in, this, in the system. So um, it's been shown actually by fetal stem cells, neural stem cell transplantation. It was done by Kurt Fried in Colorado, University of Colorado, that so they cured about nearly 20 patients by transplanting um, fetal brain dopaminergic neurons into the patient who suffered with, from, with Parkinson's disease. So and this give, gave enormous hope to, for cell-based therapy using stem cells. And um, diseases like Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's disease, where mm, it's age-related disease and um, it's mostly a memory loss. So, mm, and in my opinion, um, we need these cells probably to differentiate to dopaminergic neurons in, term, in, in case of Parkinson's disease or um, um, differentiating them to glutamergic neurons or um, this, the, the neurons that are GABAergic neurons that is actually um, hit the Alzheimer's disease. And we can actually develop drugs um, and it's probably um, understand the mechanism of di diseases in, in, in laboratory um, by doing a basic research using these cells, because there is no um, available source of these cells in order to study these diseases in, um, in vitro. And there is no uh, human neurons being tested ever for, to develop uh, in pharmaceutical companies to develop the drugs for, this, the, uh, for these diseases. And we really hope that, the, and it's been done, there are lots of uh, research in understanding the mechanism of these diseases been done already by using 
uh, mouse model, transgenic model um, of, of Parkinson or Alzheimer or ALS, and we used um, to we already understand a lot about these diseases, but physiology between the mouse and human is quite different. And this is probably one of the biggest issues in the field, and this is probably why we don't have in the market uh, very specific drugs in order, if not to treat these diseases um, in elderly people. Um, and the induced pluripotent stem cells gives us uh, probably the biggest advantage because we can tailor the, the, the model specifically for uh, the patients that have already disease. And in particular in our lab, we use a genetic form of Parkinson's disease and genetic form uh, of um, Alzheimer's disease. And we take the skin biopsies from the families that carry mutations and um, and have a history of developing early onset of these diseases. And by having a mutation, for example, um, in Alzheimer's disease, the mutation, so there is n n known three genes that are mutated in, in genetic form of Alzheimer's disease, and it's a APP, it's a amyloid precursor protein mutation in that gene, or uh, mutation in presenilin 1 and presenilin 2. So we, ta we took those cells into the lab and we reprogrammed them into the stem cells and then we differentiate them into neural stem cells and then we differentiate the neural stem cells to spe specific type of neurons that have been actually um, and, uh, hit by the diseases and we look at the function of the neurons in, in the petri dishes and we see um, w the biggest challenge probably for disease modeling is to find not just to differentiate which is another challenge in, 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 in the labs but not just differentiate to the specific type of neurons for example but the biggest challenge is still to find a phenotype of the disease in in vitro petri dishes and that is probably the most challenging part. And if we do have a phenotype, then we can actually use um, the screening, small molecule screening technology, high throughput screening in order to actually change this phenotype to normal, from disease to normal. And if the, we do find it, then we can actually transfer those small molecules to pharmaceutical company to develop drugs. And I think that's probably, at the moment, it's the biggest advantage of using IPS technology f to, do, to model the diseases. So 95 or nearly 99% of Parkinson and Alzheimer are sporadic. And it's only a small set of the population with, within uh, uh, patients, with uh, Alzheimer patients, are actually genetic. But if we take um, a sporadic, which we do take a sporadic patient's biopsy and reprogram them, we might not see, because the genetic form of the Alzheimer disease is differs from sporadic by about 20 to 30 years of onset of the disease. The start of the disease is much earlier in genetic form. And we know that there is already genes that has mutated, but we very little know about sporadic Parkinson or sporadic Alzheimer. What the cause could be very different, but outcome of the disease in the end is the same. So in case of genetic form of Parkinson and Alzheimer, we know specifically what mutations they carry. So it's, it's a probably best for us to study um, genetic form because we will see much earlier, we will see the phenotype. We know what this mutation causes already um, and then we can actually compare it to sporadic and we want to see if the how phenotype of Alzheimer actually will develop in sporadic form in the petri dish. I think that um, will be, it is a challenge, I understand, but it's also a benefit to use both at the same time. So the biggest 
problem probably is, so we have to have very specific differentiation protocol to a certain type of, for example, not just um, to neural lineages. And this is actually doesn't, uh, doesn't work all, always. Uh, and a pure population, for example, of the desired cell type. If we talk about Alzheimer's or Parkinson, you need a pure population of dopaminergic neurons. And more is better to study this disease. But it also is important for us to mimic some microenvironment of the brain. So do we really need just dopaminergic neurons alone, or do we need um, surrounding cells that is actually cons the brain consists in actually surrounded dopaminergic neurons? So what is the biggest interaction between those cells? So if the signaling pathway between an inter micro environment between the neuron, different types of neurons, and not just the neurons, but other neuronal types like microglia, or um, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, because they, the brain or central nervous system or peripheral nervous system consists f with lots of other type of cells. And how important those cells are for developing, for example, specific cell types. And I think um, that probably will be the biggest, um, I would say, challenge in in vitro system, but we, we try to understand it and make a co-culture system in order to mimic the, the microenvironment of, of particular cell or tissue. A future, I, as I can see, it can be understanding the mechanism of the disease because it's a human system in in vitro, in vitro system. It's a human, physiologically, it's a human system. It's a human neurons. Um, so I do believe that this is, will be the perfect and only system probably that will be used to understand a human uh, development and the development of the diseases. And what I see in the future that will be very specific drugs will be developed in the nearest future will be developed by using this system. In the further away, I'm hoping <laughs> that it can be uh, applied as a therapeutic, so it can be in transplantation therapy. I can't say for sure that I am actually believing to this too much, but, um, but for certain disease, I believe it can. For spinal cord injuries, I think it would be much more, um, not easy, I would say, but much more faster application compared to the complex diseases like Alzheimer's. But for those diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson, I think the biggest benefit, as I can see in the future, is very specific drug screening platform.